you've decided to tackle audience. The first thing you need to figure out is who are you impacting with your broader impact? Who needs to know about your research? So if you're working on jellies, ask yourself, who should care about jellies? Grad students. No, think bigger than grad students. And no, you can't just throw up a website and be done with it. There are millions of websites out there that no one looks at. You need to think bigger than single websites and grad students. The good thing is that there are lots of possibilities. Once you have a feel for who's out there, you can figure out A, how to reach them, and B, who you can work with to help you reach them. So, who's out there? Well, there are many options. You've got museums, virtual learning experiences, homeschoolers, policymakers, media outlets, community colleges, and underrepresented, underserved after school programs, just to name a few. To help you figure out which audience is the right fit for you, it comes down to what you feel most comfortable doing. Do you like to talk to people? Do you like to talk to kids? Do you like to talk to um, people in museum situations? Or are you more comfortable working with someone to put together a static display that talks, that explains what you do? Because actually, you're not a very comfortable speaker and you know little kids are probably not your thing. That's fine. Grade school, middle school, and high school students. And that's a population that's of particular interest to me. And I try to bring my own research into the classroom and I've seen over the years how exciting that is for students. In our town, the, the school science fairs are very prominent and so they're always kind of looking for scientists to help students with projects and, and, and to judge them and that kind of thing. So I think that came to mind to me. It could be like an undergraduate class that I'm teaching and I'll know they need some, some information on a specific science topic that I'm studying. It could be like fishing groups that I've run into in the past. We always have this uh, prior knowledge of, of each other, some prior trust and uh, some, some understanding of each other's needs. Three variables you'll be thinking about are contact time, audience size, and depth of knowledge. Let's look at contact time and audience size first. With relatively small audiences like a lecture or a formal classroom setting, you have a lot of time to talk about interesting jelly phenomena. So, small audience, lots of contact time. But on the radio or on television, which reaches a huge audience, you may only have a few minutes for some major jelly facts. So, huge audience, small contact time. As you can see, they're inversely proportional. Now let's go to depth of knowledge. There's also a range of how much interesting stuff you can talk about that goes from a deep understanding of your research to covering just a few key salient points. Bigger audiences with limited contact time only allows for a more shallow understanding of your work. As your audience size shrinks, your contact time increases, and the amount of stuff you can cover increases as well. So, more focused group learning, like in a classroom or lecture, would be here. Lots of contact time, lots of stuff to talk about, but smaller audience size. TV and radio programs fall here. Big audience, short contact time, and shallow depth of knowledge. In the middle are situations like museum collaborations that straddle the two extremes. So it's really important to consider these variables and figure out what works best for you. Sometimes we're packaging uh, our message to a very broad audience where you have their attention for 20 seconds. You know, and what's the message you want to get across in 20 seconds? You do have to tailor your talk or your discussion to whatever your audience is. But it's the same techniques, it's the same learning cycle. You're introducing people to new concepts and they have to learn about those. When you're communicating with a broader audience, it's about getting them to understand something fundamental and something accessible. Getting people to understand the finer points of what you're doing, that should be left for communicating with your peers. Once you've figured out what target audience works best for you, you can recruit partners to achieve your broader impact goals and who have connections with audiences you're trying to target. You know, obviously you want to look in your home institutions uh, looking for individuals that, that know how to do these types of things. The, the most effective broader impact stuff I do is, is collaborative. We have a couple of people in our department who are um, educators and working with them has been hugely uh, effective for me. I talk to the experts and I tell them what types of scientific uh, experiments we're doing, what tools we're using. They brought in a photographer and a science writer that were through the moon. I mean, they were awesome and they came on the cruise, they did daily blogs, they took photos that um, have won prizes. And it turned out to be a very huge success. 
I have kind of developed relationships with science teachers at local schools. I basically just started sending out emails to people saying, you know, this is something I want to do and are you interested? You have to do this through human contact. So you actually have to physically go do the work. You have to go to the museums or the science centers, talk to their people and see how you can interface with what they're doing. And finally, what you plan to communicate and how you plan to communicate it are essential. Kids, for example, don't like pie charts, and senators don't care about touch tanks. We asked the students, draw an underwater robot. They do a land robot, but they put a mask and fins on it. And then you get them to say, OK, what is a very smart mammal in the water? And they'll think of a dolphin. So then we have them draw a robot that you know, looks like a dolphin. So it's the same process a scientist goes through to build these, they've just gone through. And then they see it in real life. I have had the opportunity to team up recently with an organization called the Zephyr Education Foundation, whose mission it is to raise uh, science awareness and literacy. We host field trips for students um, into Woods Hole. And the highlight of our day with these students is to take them out on a research cruise. Their eyes are always, you know, agog at uh, all the instruments that he has for them to play around with. And then just hear the comments of some of the kids afterwards. This is the best day of my life, which we've overheard uh, a young girl telling her mother on the cell phone right after the trip. We had proposed to do a, a, a seagoing blog. They did a video link. Um, and so I spoke to these t students in real time. And then because um, blogs beget blogs, beget hits, beget hits, we ended up with a lot of adults logging on because if you sort of said oceanographer or something just for that one month period, yeah, we were, we were really popular. Somewhere deep down, a lot of us would like to know that people think what we're doing is very cool. Yeah, for me, that was just really fun. It was like, wow, cool, you know, I'm famous for 15 minutes. So, but, you know, we're not really allowed to admit that, I think, um, out loud. So, you can't use this. <laughs> now, the wizard awaits. Thank you.